Yeah. Patty, thank you so much for that. Well, friends, good morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to First United Methodist Church of Blue Springs. My name is Andrew Nelson. I'm one of the pastors here. I just want to say thank you so much for taking a little bit of time out of your week to join us for worship. And if you're online, I want to say a special welcome to you as well. Uh, and if you are online, if you want to say those hellos and good mornings to people, I would love for you to do that as well. And actually, our discussion question for this morning relates to, you know, playing America the Beautiful. In a couple days, we get to celebrate Veterans Day, right? And so we just want to take a moment and celebrate and recognize and say thank you to all of our veterans who have put their life on the line for our freedom. And so if you are online, if you want to put a quick comment and say thank you to a veteran you know, uh, we would love for you to put that in the comments below. And if you are new or, you know, you've been with us for just a couple, couple times, uh, we'd love for you to fill out a connection card. It's a simple form that lets us know that you've been with us, how to pray for you, and maybe what your next steps here at the church could be. Maybe it's joining a Sunday school class or a small group or serving in, in some capacity. So if you're online, the form is, is on the, in the description or in the comments below as well. So let us continue with worship and let us stand together for our call to worship. Let us see the light God sends this day. Light breaks forth like the dawn, drawing us into relationship with one another. Let us humble, our, humble ourselves for the worship of God. God calls us to trust with steady hearts and to serve with righteous compassion. Let us find unity in this new day. God make us the salt of the earth and light to show God's works to the world. Welcome, friends. Let us worship our God. And friends, let us continue standing and sing along with our wonderful chancel choir. Will you come and you may be seated. We've come now to the part of our service where we have an opportunity to give back to God some of our gifts and offerings. And I just want to say really quickly, I want to add my welcome to Andrews. And I'm so glad you've taken some time to be with us today and to watch with us online at home. Whether you're in this space or at home, for God, we are the church together, no matter our proximity to one another. Now, yesterday, I, ha I have a confession to make. Uh, Beth and I did uh, postmarital premarital counseling, uh, which, uh, you know, what I try to do is for every wedding that I do, I encourage uh, people that I'm doing a ceremony for to make sure that they do premarital counseling. Well, our pastor required us the same thing of us, and we just couldn't work in the schedule with their church, and so we ended up doing it yesterday. And I got to say, six weeks into marriage, 
Uh, it's, a, it's a different experience than the engagement period. And so uh, I kind of am fond of postmarital, premarital counseling myself. But as part of that, we had to sit down and actually work on a budget for part of this. Isn't that funny? Like at church, work on a budget. And as you know, and we had to discuss uh, like what that line's going to be when it comes to what we give back. I mean, we live in a culture where so often when it comes to our resources and our lives, it could feel like the things that we have are purely for us. And it's really countercultural, and it's really a stretch, and you have to really push your muscles and use muscles that maybe uh, you, and I know I haven't, didn't have growing up. And so we had to make the decision of like, okay, well now that we're putting our, like we're figuring out the bank account situation and different salaries and work and different values that we're bringing to this, and what are we going to give as a, as a couple and as a family now? And so we had that conversation yesterday, so it's fresh in my mind. And it just, it just made me realize that, you know, so often when it comes to faith, uh, when it, and, 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 and generosity and finances and resources and things like that, it's complicated. And so I just want to say thank you for those of you who have had those conversations and have made commitments. And, and oftentimes we'll use language in the church like, this couldn't happen without you. And that's absolutely true. But underneath the surface also is this call from our God that we're living lives that are different and set aside and for a purpose. And as part of that is this call to to be generous in some capacity and to stretch ourselves. And all of us are in different places. And so thank you for being a church that doesn't just give lip service to faith, but also acts it out in an incredible way. Uh, Thank you for being faithful to your call and to your faith uh, in Christ. And so I just want to take a quick moment to bless our offering and our offertory. And, And even in the midst of a pandemic, God is still moving here. So let's pray together. God, thank you for the sweet growth spot of being people who are called to be generous. And God, whether it's generous here at the church or generous to people personally we know who are in need or generous to other organizations we believe in, God, help us to live lives that are about others. And so as we dive into this sermon series and into this concept of being a blessing in the mass, we just ask you to help us find part of our calling and purpose and being a force of good and light and soul in this world. Bless this offering that it may make a difference and an impact uh, in, in this church, in the lives of young people here and in our world. In your holy name we pray. Amen. And now I invite you to enjoy this offertory. for that. That is, that was beautiful. And also ties into exactly what we're talking about with our sermon series, Bless in the Mess. 
But at this time, we have a special, a special treat for everyone. So uh, we actually have Mona Candia with us, our next gen director. And so we're just going to have a simple conversation up here. And, and friends, uh, just kind of introduce you to, to who she is and what she's going to do here at the church. And so uh, we just want to have a really simple conversation. If you haven't got a chance to watch her introduction video on, on Facebook, she talks about your, your cute puppies and Mexican food, right? I think that was, yeah. that was it's a really great video. So uh, I would encourage you to find that on Facebook if you haven't watched it already. So Mona, my first question is, okay, you've been here for a week. It's been a pretty simple week, right? It's been very slow. Nothing has happened. I'm just kidding. Uh, so yeah, we did uh, Trunk or Treat. We did, uh, I've met all of the staff. We did youth ministry on Wednesday night. We did kids ministry last Sunday. We got to deliver some Bibles. Like it's been a very busy and good first week. That's right. And so you've delivered the Bibles with uh, Joanne and that's, yes. that was such a really special moment. And I yeah. think I think we have a video for that. So let's watch this moment together with Joanne and Mona handing out some Bibles to our, our second graders. Sounds good. love their smiling faces. I don't know if you caught that. That was so beautiful just to see the excitement they had. And so what was, what was your favorite part of, of that moment? Yeah, the excitement on their faces and the joy and the wonder. Um, this is the very first Bible for themselves. Maybe they got one when they were a baby, but this is like the one that they're going to dive into until they, until really for the rest of their life, maybe, depending yeah. on if they do that. So this is like the very first time that they get to experience for themselves in their own Bible, how much God loves them, which is like the whole story of the Bible. That's so great. I love how you say that because that, that really is what the Bible is. It's God's love story to us. And, you know, giving it to those second graders, it really inspires them to, to get into that and understand that love story to us. Absolutely. That's so great. And so uh, my next question is, so do you like kids and youth? Uh, you know, is this... No, yes, I absolutely love kids and youth. I have done kids ministry, I've done youth ministry, and the thing that I continue to love and appreciate about them is just how much hope they bring to us and to the world. Um, our job as a church and, and really people who are investing in our young people is to help them figure out who they are, their gifts and talents and their abilities, and when we help them do that, like they're going to change the world, uh, and there's just so much hope and excitement in that. That's exactly right, and so I think we've used the term next gen, but I wonder if, if everybody understands what that term is. So can you explain a little bit more about what next gen is? Absolutely. So we are looking at it birth to uh, 12th grade. Sometimes college is included in that. Uh, but really, the next generation is the ones that we are raising up today to be the church. And not just like be the church eventually, but be the church today. So our job as next gen uh, and as people in the church to invest in next gen is to look at them and say, how do we empower them today? And how do we help them figure out today how God is moving in them and working in them. So Nexion is like this overarching model and umbrella of saying uh, children and youth together, uh, the family unit in that is one big unit. And so our job as a church is to figure out how do we support them and figure out who they are in God. So it's not just your role, it's like all of our roles to you know, impart and inspire the next generation that really isn't the next generation that's far off, it's here, right? Absolutely, yeah, yes. That is, that is so amazing. So yep. I know you had a couple other offers, so why did you take this job? Yeah, I'm really excited about, uh, again, I've said I've had kids ministry experience and youth ministry experience, but we have families who have kids in youth and in uh, kids ministry. And so if we're not helping the family to be the best family and to resource them to live out their faith like Monday through Saturday, not just on Sunday morning, then we aren't doing our job. So I'm really excited to look at the family unit as a whole, next gen as a whole, and say, how do we support our generation today and our families today? I love that. Yes. And so, so finally, friends, I, I don't know if you know, but we have a little special guest with us as well. And so I, I saw uh, this little friend in Mona's office, and I had to ask, what, 
what it was all about. And so I think Mona has a pretty amazing story about this little friend. Yeah, so this is a, a sloth named Veronica. And uh, when I was at a church uh, north of the river, I had, it was after one day I had preached, and this little girl came up to me, probably kindergarten, first grade at that time, and she said, I want to be just like you when I grow up. Like, I want to be a preacher, and I want to work with kids, and, and I, wanted, I just want to be like you. And I thought that was incredibly cool. Then when I left, she had given me this Build-A-Bear. So she had built one for me at Build-A-Bear, and then she built one for her. So she named hers after me and mine after her. And so she's got one in her home. I have one in my office, and I keep it there as a reminder that, one, little girls are paying attention everywhere, and also little boys are paying attention too, right? And also as a reminder that investing in our young people and looking at them in the eye and spending time with them and figuring out all of the silly things about them that they love and that are frustrating to them, like, that will never, ever be wasted. So I keep it in my office as a reminder of why I do what I do and why, why we do what we, what we do. That's awesome. Yeah, and you've only been here a week, and you've inspired me just to invest in our young people and just nice. the way that you, you've worked with the youth. And Thanks. last week, the trunk, trunk retreat, it was really amazing to see you at work. Thank and so, you. friends, uh, at this time, we're going to take a moment and just pray for Mona and her ministry and, and how we can all be a part of it as well. So, friends, this, this might feel weird, and even if you're online at home, let's just lean into this together. Let's just raise hands to Mona, and we're going to pray over her. Lord, at this time, we ask for your blessing on Mona and her ministry and all of the young boys and girls that she is going to inspire. Lord, we pray for, for fervor and for wisdom and for grace and mercy that she'll be with not only those young people, but their families and our volunteers. And also, Lord, I pray for our church to surround the next generation, the next generation that, that isn't far off, but is here, that's in our church. Lord, I pray at this time for Mona and the young people and the families and the volunteers that are going to impact our ministry. And it's your most holy and precious name that I pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Mona, for being up here. Let's give Mona a round of applause. She is going to be an amazing part of our church. And, and friends, that really leads me into today's prayer time. So as you've seen, we've got really amazing things happening in the church and, and new things, brand new things happening around our, our kids and youth and confirmation ministry. But even more than that, we've got things happening throughout the church. And so at this time, this prayer, we're going to pray for the people that are here today, our families and our congregations that we love so much. But we're also going to pray for new people. We're going to pray for those people that are online to, to take that next step, maybe to jump in and fill out that connection card, or maybe those families that are thinking about coming and seeing what our ministry is all about, that, that they would take that leap and that we would be a family for them, that we would be welcoming for them. So that's, that's what we're going to pray for today. And, and friends, we're going to have a time to pray for our, our joys and concerns as well, but that's really what we're going to mainly pray about today. So friends, at this time, will you join me in going to our Heavenly Father in prayer. O oh, most merciful and heavenly Father, you have given us grace upon grace. Lord, you have blessed us with so much. You have blessed us with a church family that loves so much. Lord, you have given us the gifts to, to hire Mona and the ministry that, we, that she will take on and the families that she will impact, and the young people, and the confirmation in youth, and through graduation, to the students that she will inspire. Lord, please be with her, but also be with the volunteers, and the parents, and, and us as the church, that we get a chance to surround them in your love. Lord, I pray that you would be near them, near our students, our young people, our volunteers, that your Holy Spirit would surround them in love. And Lord, I pray that our church leans into this, whatever that looks like for them, that they would see them as a gift, this next generation, the next generation of leaders that will take this church to places we may never have seen before. So Lord, may we be the church that is a light on the hill, that builds bridges, that brings families and young people to you, Lord. 
we are excited that we get to partner with you in this. Lord, at this time, I pray for Mona. Lord, at this time, I pray for the young people and students that she will impact. Lord, I pray for the volunteers that will serve in ministry alongside her. Lord, I pray now for our congregation, our church, our family that will wrap these young people in love. And now, Lord, we get a chance to bring our burdens before you. Lord, I know we have people in this congregation and at home that are hurting, that have pains and burdens. And so, Lord, at this time, let's bring to you our pains, our burdens, our concerns in the silence of our hearts. And now, Lord, we get to bring before you our joys, the great things that have happened this week, the celebrations that we have, the, the mountaintop moments that we may have experienced within this last week. Lord, it is all a blessing from you. And so, Lord, at this time, in the silence of our hearts, let us bring before you our joys. And now, Lord, let us lift our voices together as one church as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we're going to continue to worship with our scripture reading, so will you stand for our scripture video? Good, good morning, First Church. It's great to be with you today. My name is Emma. And my name is Autumn Jo, and we'll be reading this morning's scripture, which, can, which comes to us from the book of John. We're going to be reading chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. When they finished eating, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon replied, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. Jesus asked the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon replied, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, Take care of my sheep. He asked the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was sad that Jesus asked him a third time, Do you love me? He replied, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Good. You may be seated. Well, friends, good morning. Today we're starting a sermon series called Bless in the Mess. And it probably doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what we mean by mess in this title. Uh, if you had to take your guess, you'd probably be right. Uh, Bless in the Mess refers to the state of the world, that things are messy. Um, that doesn't matter who, if a new president or an old president or whoever comes along. Everybody has a mess still. That there's not one person that can solve the issues that the world is facing. And, and so this is a series that we wanted to take, especially as we lean into the holidays, as we get closer to Thanksgiving, as we look at where our church is going in the next year. We wanted to help you by thinking about how you can help others. That this is a, an area where it doesn't matter what's going on, that if you have found a place where you can bless people, you'll have a better life too. So in this series, we're going to dive in. And to broach this topic, I want to start with a story that a lot of us are probably familiar with. 
You've either, uh, either have it uh, maybe a, a, in your bathroom or on your mantle somewhere. You might have retweeted it on Pinterest, although I don't think that's how that works. You've seen it on Facebook. Uh, and maybe this story will uh, jog your memory. Take a look. One day, a man was walking along the beach when he noticed a boy picking up starfish and throwing them into the ocean. Approaching the boy, he asked, Excuse me, but what are you doing? The boy replied, Throwing starfish back into the ocean. The sun is rising and the tide is going out. If I don't throw them back, they'll die. The man laughed to himself and said, But there's too many starfish on this beach. You can't possibly make a difference. After listening politely, the boy bent down, picked up another starfish and threw it into the ocean. Then turning to the man, he said, I made a difference to that one. You might be familiar with the starfish story, and it's a beautiful illustration of the reality that while there might be overwhelming odds against, uh, against us or an overwhelming mess in front of us, that you can make a difference for that one. You know, it's a story that really is encouraging. It makes you feel a little less helpless. It makes you realize what the, that each of us has something to offer. But you know what? You could tell it wasn't made in 2020 because no one was wearing masks in that story. Uh, and also, it feels a little naive, doesn't it? It's just a little too sweet for the, wor- the, the, for the world we're living in right now. And so I decided to take some time, uh, and, and some of you might think this is wasted time, but I took some time to reimagine this story for 2020 and how this story would impact the world today. And so... Uh, uh, let's, let's look at some of these uh, situations, a few scenarios that I've come into to help the starfish story fit into 2020. The first scenario that I came up with was this one. I don't know if you guys can see this. I, I, I went and made a fake news page here, and it says here, protest demand starfish go home. I wrote a little tagline here. It says this, once the local townsfolk picked up on this starfish infestation, they gathered together to make their voice heard. Local news ran the story and it went viral. Pretty soon global protests broke out worried about starfish ignoring national boundaries and borders. Uh, And so I wrote even little things in there. Are starfish invasive? Find out where they'll land next. Which came first, the star or the starfish? They've gone too far, says former biologist turned army sergeant. Okay, uh, I might have gone a little, a little overboard with my uh, illustrations here. If this one doesn't you know, get you excited about the modern version, then this next one might. Uh, this is selfies for starfish. This, I feel like this would be maybe a modern version of the story. Uh, after the little boy threw the starfish back into the ocean, he had a better idea. He got a cell phone, uh, even though he's 10, and rather than throw uh, more starfish in the ocean himself, he, he decided to raise awareness about starfish starfish uh, uh, coming up on the ocean or uh, on the beach and pretty soon hashtag selfies for starfish uh, took off with a combined 18 billion likes uh, on social media outlets uh, and they saved approximately 17 starfish from their efforts. Uh, If if that one doesn't feel like it really fits for 2020, I came up with this one. Uh, uh, You know, maybe this could be like a news report that's going on. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see this. Are starfish spreading COVID-19? Oh, no. What could happen? Uh, You you can see here, you're wondering, you didn't know my Photoshop skills were this good. I I know. It's pretty impressive. There's a mask on a starfish. Okay. This one I said, once news outlets covered the starfish story, folks began to notice that the starfish on the beach looked sick. Soon after, rumors began that it was starfish, not bats, that started COVID-19. All right, finally, I got a laugh in here. Praise the Lord. Somebody thought that was... All right, then I made up this new one. You guys are more familiar with these things. I think they're called newspapers. Um, uh, So I made up this one here. It's from the Daily Ocean Gazette. Uh, It says this, starfish savior 
abandons drowning man. I even wrote like a fake little uh, thing here. After spending months advocating for a local community to raise funds to save the starfish, 12-year-old Rick Savey is accused of being nearby on the beach as a man drowned just hundreds of feet away. Savey's attorney claims his client doesn't even know how to swim yet, but the excuse has fallen flat on, on the ears of most Amer Americans. On Tuesday, a grand trial will decide his fate. Uh, you know, like maybe that's the modern day uh, version. And if you guys, uh, you know, if you're, if you might be grateful. I didn't, I have two more, but I didn't actually make things for them. I just thought they'd be funny. Uh, here, here'd be other headlines. Uh, a church's starfish GoFundMe page funds pastor's yacht. You know, there'd be a, there'd be a, uh, some controversy around that one. Uh, newsflash, little girl separates starfish from family. Uh, you know, the, the, I'm, I'm being a little funny here. I'm making some mock-ups of these things. And, and it, might make, it might actually increase your anxiety level. Because I know when I was making these things, it actually made me more anxious to make up these fake stories about something that's not even happening. Um, see, these don't have the same feel as the original starfish story do that, even though they might be more accurate to 2020. And I have a theory why, even though I've kind of joked about it, I think the original story has a lot more, uh, you know, impact on us emotionally. And it's this, the feeling of being overwhelmed by the problems in front of us. This is what makes that original story have such an impact is that so often what can happen is we can look at the state of things, we can look at the world, and our, our reaction and our response can to be feel overwhelmed by things. And, and honestly, just those fake news stories, they didn't make you feel any better, did they? Because we're already overwhelmed by the state of things. And so this is where, why that starfish story is so encouraging, because there's part of us that when we hear that, we realize that we have a little bit of hope that we could possibly make things better. When we realize that, you know, I could make a difference for that one, that our efforts aren't in vain, that we make a difference with our lives, that in the face of overwhelming odds, good can still happen one starfish at a time. That's the power of that little story. And it's a story that we care about because it's a story about not getting overwhelmed about how little we can do and how much there is to fix. And so today, I want to bring our attention to a story that Jesus, uh, a story about Jesus, a conversation that Jesus had with uh, one disciple in particular, and, and the advice that he has about how to tackle and think about a world that seems overwhelming with its issues and what a Christian's response should be to that world. And so uh, we're going to start off, and before we get to the story, I want to set the stage here. So where our story starts off today is uh, immediately after, or in the weeks after Jesus has been uh, crucified, killed, put in a tomb, raised three days later, and he has been, at this point in his story, uh, appearing to some of his disciples over a number of weeks. And so Jesus, at this point in the story, it has appeared to his disciples uh, as they were on the beach of this lake shore, and uh, there were no starfish, I think, in native to this beach in Israel. And, uh, and so Jesus is on this beach with his disciples, and there's a conversation that happens right after dinner, and that's where we're starting. And so it says this, when they finished eating, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. So this is the Peter, Peter the rock, uh, Peter Petros rock. Uh, you're going to be the one I make the church stand on. You know, this is, this is the, the disciple, the rock, uh, not the celebrity. Uh, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Like, do you love me more than everyone else? This is a leading question and one that has a backstory to it. So, we're going to go back a few weeks to understand an interaction that happened between Peter and Jesus so that we can understand this interaction. So we pause here. We flash back to something we call the Last Supper. Jesus at this point, no, it's game over. He's upset some religious leaders. There's some folks who are out to take him down. He knows his time is running out. And so he gathers his disciples together. Some people think this is a Passover meal. Some people think it's the night before Passover. Uh, no one knows for sure, but this is the last time he gets to sit with his disciples. And so he spends, in the book of John, chapters and chapters and chapters um, 
actually giving them kind of his last lessons, and they're beautiful lessons. And so Jesus is trying to impart the last piece of wisdom that he can to them. And then in the, at some point in this meal, he talks about how he will be betrayed that evening. And so this conversation propels Peter to make an interesting uh, statement. And here's what Peter actually says. Uh, Simon Peter said to Jesus, Lord, where are you going? Well, he's talking about dying. And Jesus answered, where I'm going, you can't follow me now, but you'll follow me later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll give up my life for you. And Jesus replied, will you give up your life for me? I assure you that you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. Which we might be familiar with the story, but it's another way of saying, dude, before, before morning you're going to deny me three times. You know, this is the evening. He's like, before the night's even over, you're going to deny me. What do, you, what do you mean that you would die for me? You're, you're, not, even, you're not even committed enough to, to like, not deny me. Uh, like, please, you, you've got some strange expectations for yourself. That's this conversation. And then a few hours later, Jesus goes away to pray. He's taken by these uh, soldiers and religious leaders away. He's taken to uh, a religious leader's uh, home, which is really like a big area where they've got in the, in the night secretly trying to uh, have Jesus relig- go through this religious trial and, find, and convict him of something. And so uh, they gather secretly together, but there's a big crowd. Word's gotten out, and Peter shows up. And so a few hours later, this happens, and it says this. Uh, Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing with the guards, warming himself. And they asked, aren't you one of his disciples? And Peter denied it, saying, I'm not. And a servant of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said to him, "Um, didn't I see you in the garden with him? And Peter denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. I accidentally left off the first one. So three different times, just like Jesus said, Peter denies Jesus that evening. Like that evening, after he committed to say, I would die for you, he, he denies knowing him. He's scared. He saves his own hide. And if you've ever seen the movie, The Passion of the Christ, at this point, uh, you know, they imagine this moment where Jesus is in this place. He's surrounded by people, but there's a break in the crowd, and he looks up, and he sees Peter, and you see this dawning realization of Peter realizing that Jesus was right. Uh, and that he has way overballed his commitment, and he flees. And friends, we don't think about this, but that's the last moment that, that, that Peter sees Jesus before Jesus is, is crucified and executed by the state. Uh, that's it. Only one of the 12 disciples actually are at the cross when Jesus dies. Jesus is, there, Jesus is up there, and he's without his disciples. Eleven of them have run away, abandoned him when it counted most. And so when Jesus shows up again to those disciples, of course we imagine the relief, we imagine the excitement, we imagine how happy they are to see Jesus. But have you ever really blown it with somebody, done something wrong, hurt someone's feelings, and then you see them again later, and there's this moment of like sheepish, like, hey, so sorry I was a jerk. Sorry I said that. Sorry I spent your thing. You know, like, sorry I ate your cake in the free. You know, like, hey, like, are we good? You know, like, there's a little bit of that moment there for the disciples. For Peter, he's seeing Jesus again after denying him, after abandoning him, after running, and it's just made worse by his overestimation of his commitment and loyalty to Jesus. This is the scenario. So now back to the lakeside, to the beach, and Jesus and Peter, remember this? So when he says, when they finished eating, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these guys? There's a little bit of this kind of sheepish moment. I wonder if Peter's face flushes a little bit. I wonder if if he feels a little bit of shame around this. And then here's how the rest of the conversation goes. It says this, Simon replied, so Simon and Peter, same thing. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. And Jesus asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. And then he asked a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And you, in this moment, I wonder if Peter's thinking, 
yeah, I get it. I denied you three times. You're asking me how committed I am three times. Yeah, okay. yeah thanks. Yeah, Jesus, I get it. Okay, I, I blew it. Uh, and, and he replied, Lord, you know everything. You know, we both know what the reality is. We both know I overestimated my commitment. We both, we both know that I'm a failure. Uh, you know everything. You know I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed, feed my sheep. And this story, I think we like. We tell this story a lot in church. You probably, you're probably familiar with this story if you've been around church any amount of time. We like this story a lot. And yet, uh, there's more here than we read necessarily in our English uh, translation. And so I want to take a moment and unpack some of the wordplay that's happening here between Jesus and Peter. Uh, you know, this is kind of funny. If, 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 if This is like the first time I understood that the Bible had some different language wordplay. I think this was the story I learned. Oh, like the original language is a little different here. So you might be familiar with what I'm about to share with you already, but I, I still think it's really powerful. And so when Jesus has this conversation with Peter, basically he's using a really specific word here for love. And the word is agape. This is a, a, a Christian favorite. You, probably three of you have this tattooed on your body somewhere, right? right you all look like that type. Um, agape. Uh, this, this, is, this is sacrificial, divine love. This is a love that would sacrifice yourself for, uh, for someone. I mean, this is a transcends uh, selfishness. You know, this is an incredible uh, kind of love. And, and Jesus is asking him this. He says, you know, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter responds, and in the English we hear him say, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Uh, except in the original language, Peter uses a different word. Peter's not answering Jesus' question. He says, yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. Philo, you might be familiar with, for, for instance, like the city of Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love or love. It's the, the brotherly love. It's this idea of, of friendship love, of, of fondness, of connection, uh, like a bro. Uh, this, is a, this is the kind of love that Peter responds with. Uh, Jesus says, hey, remember, that, remember the other night when you said you'd die for me? Do you, you, you agape me? Do you love me that much? <laughs> and, and there's this moment where Peter's like, yeah, Lord, you know I'm your bro. We, I, lo I love you. Like, it's just this, it's a different response. He's not exactly answering the question. Um, this is like uh, in a dating relationship where, I don't know if you've heard this, you have this moment called the DTR, define the relationship. And uh, someone might be like, uh, you know, hey, listen, I love you. And the other person, uh, if you're unlucky, says, yeah, I like you too. Uh, that's the kind of moment that this, that this is here. Uh, and some, I see some spouses that are like, remember that moment, honey? Um, and so like, that is what happened here. Peter doesn't respond with the same thing. So the story continues, and Jesus asks him, uh, do you love me? A second time. And, uh, and, and Peter, let's, can we go back a slide? And, and Peter responds the, the same way. Yeah, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I, I love you like a buddy. So we have this first question. We have this happen the second question. And then when you might think that Jesus pushes in even more, wants to get some kind of commitment from Peter, wants to see him rise to the occasion, you actually see Jesus take a different path. He asks him, do you love me? And then he uses this word. He says, do you follow me? Jesus is the one who changes what he says here. And Jesus says, all right, Peter, do you love me like a friend? And Peter responds back, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you like a friend. So what does this mean? Like, what's happening here? Why the change in language? Like, what, what exactly are we seeing happen here? And, and something that I love about this story is this reality that, uh, that, 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 that Peter comes to Jesus with this, with this kind of newly humbled outlook. 
He's dropped the ball. He's abandoned his savior and friend and rabbi. He's, he's, uh, he sees himself as a failure here. He's barely hanging on. He sees Jesus again. He's not sure. He, he it probably brings up shame in his own life. Uh, and, and he has this moment where Jesus, and then Jesus presses him. Do you really love me like you said? Remember that the other night, buddy? And, uh, and, and, and Peter has this moment where he could just give lip service to Jesus to get out of this challenging moment, and he, and he doesn't. Peter actually is honest with Jesus after the resurrection, after the miracles, after all of it, and says, you know, Jesus, I, I probably don't agape you. I, I probably, I, I know I like you, but we both have seen where that landed me and where when when rubber hit the road like how i acted and the honest truth is i like you a lot and i care about what you say but man i don't know how committed i am ultimately and and jesus says okay in fact i'd say this that jesus doesn't even care that peter's level of commitment isn't agape level that Peter likes Jesus, likes being friends with Jesus, has a positive connection with Jesus. And to Jesus, that's enough. Like, that's actually enough. And there's reason for this and some stuff that I want to unpack us together. See, what Jesus says to Peter is like, listen, I don't need you to be perfect. What I need you to do is to care. Uh, uh, He basically says this, I just want you to feed my sheep. I don't need you to be perfect. I don't need you to be 100% committed. I don't need you to be ready to die for me. I need you to care enough that you'll take care of the people I ask you to take care of. That is Jesus' concern. And what happens so often in church environments is that we can have this attitude that if you are not 100% sold out for Jesus, you're not, it's not enough. If you are not ready to die for Jesus, you are not bought in enough. If you are not ready to to like be done with your sin and be perfect, then, then you are not good enough that you shouldn't have a place here. You know, I, I cannot tell you strongly enough that this is at no point Jesus' mentality about being his follower. At no point did he go for perfection. At no point did he want people to be perfect before they worked with him. At no point was he looking for flawless individuals. And yet, so many of us face that, that we like Jesus and we feel it's not enough. And you know what? For Jesus... It was enough because Jesus wasn't looking for perfection. He was looking for people to get to work, for people who wanted to make a difference. And and what he basically told Peter is, look, I don't need you to be perfect because the difference you make makes all of the difference. The difference that your life makes makes all of the difference. You do not have to have it all together. You do not have to be perfect. You do not have to be sinless. You do not have to have, have a life of no doubt or a complete conviction. What you bring is good enough. Just feed some sheep. And, and, and this is uh, another way of saying that is Jesus saying, hey, just, just take care of some starfish. Feed my sheep. Throw some starfish in. I don't need you to be perfect. I don't need you to solve everything. I just need you to care. Just do a little bit. Use what you've got to make a difference. And then he says something that's interesting. The conversation continues, and this is the very next verse. So do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed feed my sheep. And then he says this. And we usually skip this part when we're telling this story. This is Jesus talking. I assure you that when you were younger, you tied your own belt and walked around wherever you wanted. And when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and others will tie your, and another will tie your belt and lead you where you don't want to go. And I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes in the Bible, like a verse seems to like change the subject. The Bible does this a lot. Uh, And sometimes it's just moving on. And sometimes it actually has a lot to do with the topic. This has a lot to do with the topic, actually. So he's talking with Peter. 
Peter's, you know, got some self-doubt. He's asking him about feeding his sheep. And then he says, listen, man, uh, when you're younger, you tied your own belt. So back then, you know, we didn't wear, <laughs> people didn't wear pants. Pants weren't invented yet. Um, somebody could have made a lot of money by making some of those. Uh, no, they wore robes, and then you're, you know, you tied your belt. That was your pants. And so the modern-day equivalent of this would be Jesus being like, hey, man, did you put your pants on today? Uh, and I imagine that Peter's like, what? Excuse me? Like, yeah, you put your own pants on, right? Someday someone's going to have to put your pants on for you. Uh, and you might be thinking, all right, where is Jesus going with this? Well, Jesus is kind of saying this, you won't be young forever. Did, did, have you guys realized this yet? You, you won't be young forever. And the point that he's making beyond this is even this one. Uh, make a difference while you can make a difference, Peter. Listen, you put your pants on this morning, right? Someday someone else is going to put your pants on. Uh, someday someone else is going to wheel you around. Right now, you choose where you go. You choose what you do. You choose the impact you make. Someday, you're not going to be able to choose. Someday, you won't even be able to put your own pants on. And so, uh, while you can, maybe you should do something about it. And, and, and to me, this is strangely motivating. Because when it comes to life and to the world, and we come to these moments of the beach full of starfish that are going to die, and it can be overwhelming to look at all of this and say, like, who am I? What, what's the impact I can make? If I even throw a starfish, do I even care about starfish? I could be doing something else with my time. You know, like we have all these moments in life where we look at how bad things can be. We have like, what could I possibly offer? And to know, to be reminded in that moment of, hey, someday you're going to die. And someday you're not going to have impact. And someday you're not going to have ability. And you know what? You're alive right now and you have some impact right now. And so you might doubt yourself and you might have some, um, you know, you might not be the strongest. You might not be Patrick Mahomes who could throw a starfish like a mile into the ocean, but you know what? The beach isn't that far. Just you've got some life in you and some work in you and some energy in you, and so use it while you can. And you know what? That's motivating to me. You know, I, I, like I can get stuck all day on what obstacles are in my way or how I fall short. And I will even say this, when it comes to ministry, man, it is a miracle. It is a million to one that I became a minister because uh, there was a zillion other things I would have rather done. And, and then the other reality is I never thought I was good enough. I never thought I was proper enough. I never thought I'd have the right words to say. I never thought that I was religious enough. I thought I had too many questions, too many issues, too much history, too much baggage. I don't even like people that much, uh, you know, and I was worried that I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, a, like, why, who am I to be in this? Like, it would, it's almost like this weird, yeah, what, how highly do you have to think of yourself to think that you could help people spiritually? And, and, and it took a long time for God to say to me, like, no, that's exactly who I need you to be, because this whole thing has become too religious, too routine, too stuck in the mud, too uh, without energy or excitement or practicality, and, 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 and I need you in all your weirdness. To, to make some weird memes to make a point on you know on the te- you know for for a group of people you know I, it was a long journey for me and I see this happen all of the time in church where people who I can absolutely see God's hand on their lives and see have the potential to make an impact who doubt themselves who think they're not religious enough not committed enough not good enough um, not not um, not b- biblically uh, literate enough and so what we do is we think well someone else is more qualified for this um, guys I, I've had conversations with people on our leadership council who every year, you know, we, we, we have a group of people who help direct the vision of the church. And I've had people be like, hey, are you sure I'm the right person? Because I'm not, I'm not sure I, you know, I'm a good enough. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. You're the right person. Like we do not need people who like fit some kind of weird vanilla cookie cutter mold of faith. We need people who God is working in their lives. And so I hope that you hear, and man, I need to say it more. And I wish churches across the country would say it more that, that Jesus is not looking for cookie cutter vanilla people to uh, to be his followers that Jesus doesn't need you to be willing to throw yourself off you know off a rooftop for him Jesus needs you in wherever you are and whatever level of fondness and commitment you are to take that next step and to make a difference with your life to let God use you where you're at uh, the Peters and Petruses or of, of this world. Like we, God is not looking, especially when he, Jesus even came to his disciples, he wasn't looking for perfection. He used this ragtag group and nothing has changed. That's still the MO, that's still what God wants, and that's still how uh, God works in us. And so I share all of that because I want you to understand 
um, that, that God, while you're putting on your pants, and, and even if someone helped you with your pants this morning, as long as you're breathing and you've got life in your lungs, you can still make an impact. And so I want to leave you with this question. What is your starfish? Where is the one place in the mess that you can bless? Whose life is going to be impacted because you took a little bit of your time and energy and commitment and, and, and care and helped someone? You don't have to fix it all, but God asks you to make an impact somewhere. And I want to, uh, to close by making sure this is kind of on topic for the day and where our church is right now. But sometimes we don't know where our starfish is. You know, you can't throw starfish in, in Missouri. There's no oceans here, right? Uh, and, and sometimes it can be hard to, to really ask God, like, hey, where are, am I supposed to make an impact? How am I supposed to make an impact? It's me. Like, I, I don't know. It doesn't, I, I don't know if I necessarily have a natural fit somewhere. I'm like, God, help me out here. And that's why I think church exists. And I don't think these systems and programs and, and services are here just because God wants us to go through these motions. I think these things are here to help us all figure out how, how, how and where we find our starfish. Like this is what happens when people come together. The whole point of coming together, whether or not you're on your couch or you're in the room, is that um, your life can make a difference. And, and that Christ pulls us together for something bigger than ourselves. The starfish for our church, and I'm going to beat this drum till, till the bishop puts me somewhere else or before, until I meet the Lord himself. Uh, the starfish for us is, is the next generation. As I have seen over and over and over churches who were just so focused on themselves that they just dropped the ball in the next generation and then their doors closed because they're like, where'd everyone go? They left because... No one invested in them. No one, in, no one cared about them. No one went outside their comfort zone to, to make them a priority. But this is happening everywhere. It's estimated that 25% of churches in America are going to close this next year. Uh, that's, a, that's heartbreaking. And part of that is because we just got comfortable and went through our motions. And, and then we didn't end up investing in younger generations. Somehow... We lost that as a priority. And the United Methodist Church is super guilty of it as a whole. Uh, but here's the thing. I don't care what the United Methodist Church does because that's the big issue problem. What I care about is the name of those eight second graders that Mona and Joanne delivered their second grade Bibles to. I care about them having adults in this church who are invested in them and who want to make an impact in their lives. Those are our starfish. We have a youth program with kids who show up even though we've put almost no resources and very little energy into our youth program. And yet those kids are super plugged in and super love their community. Like, do you know what a gift that is? Uh, we, we, we had before COVID, we had some weeks 30 to 40 kids showing up on Sunday mornings and getting involved in our first kids program. Uh, you know, like what a gift to us. How lucky are we? How blessed are we that we have anything right now. And as a church, our responsibility when it comes to when we ask God where we're going is not to say, all right, God, I'm the sheep. I'm, I, you know, feed this mouth. That's not the, that's not the conversation that, that Jesus is having with us. No, what Jesus, the conversation is having with us is, hey, listen, there's some other sheep and you've got the resources and the ability and the energy and you put your pants on. And so guess what? Uh, if you love me, no matter how, love, how much your commitment is, invest, invest, in, throw some starfish, feed some sheep. And, and, and you know, even this last week, uh, or yesterday on Facebook, and, uh, and there's, there's these Facebook groups for uh, people who, uh, you know, have worship uh, teams and stuff like that, and somebody asked, uh, you know, our church is 500 feet from a college campus, and we want to start a new service for college students, um, but we don't, you know, we're not sure we should adapt it or change it at all for college students. The pastor just wants the college students to come to the services we do. Uh, you know, should we do a different kind of service? Uh, and my response was, 
Heck yes, you should do a different kind of service. Also, you should be praying how God can use you to be a resource to invest in a totally different generation. Uh, you know, the, with the mentality of that church, you could tell by the language they were using, the mentality was, how do we just absorb them into the culture and into the things that we like? You know, the whole attitude was, we just want to have more young people in here, but we don't want to change anything. We just want it to be like we're comfortable with. And, and yet, uh, the, 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 the growth area, the opportunity there is to say, you know what? We still put our pants on this morning. We still got some energy. We still got some fire. And so you know what? We're going to take this. Res- we're going to take the- these resources and this church, and we're going to direct it, and we're going to serve these young people, and we're going to show up. And we're going to have coffee for them if they want coffee, and we're going to make sure that we ha- they have music that really meets them. And we're going to we're going to make sermons that talk about who they are and what they're facing in life. And we're going to dedicate parts of our budget to these young people because we're going to be a church that actually cares about the starfish, that feeds the sheep, that invests in the next generation. Uh, but you know how hard that is? Because our natural inclination is to make it about us. You know, well, my arm's tired. You know, it's just like, or, or, uh, or I'm hungry. Why are we feeding on these sheep? And, and, and the invite from God is to say, hey, listen, you can make a difference with the life you had. That the, that the, the difference you make makes all the difference. And at the end of this all, the point that God is trying to make to us is we don't, God doesn't need us to be perfect. God needs us to make a difference. And not only is it true that the difference you make makes all the difference, the reason this sentence works is because somebody, an individual, not the world, but somebody, hopefully can point to one of us and say, my life is better because that person showed up, because that person did the equivalent of saving that one. And so, friends, the reason I spent so much time talking about this and hammering this home and making some weird slides and stuff like that is just because this is too important to let fall off of our radar. It's too important that no matter what we're facing and the challenges and the pandemic and the space and all the, that, that this church you feed some sheep, that we don't have to be perfect. We just have to care. Would you pray with me? God, help, thank you for challenging us and for loving us. And God, we just ask that you uh, show up in our lives. You help us continue to care for those on the margins, for us to find our sheep, to find our starfish. Um, God, Thank you that we have a church that cares about our young people, that we have this ministry that we're focusing on, that we can invest in, in people, young people and help them know you and help them develop a faith of their own. And so God, when it comes to our own lives, help us while we, are, uh, while we have life in our lungs, breath in our lungs, while we've got energy to give, help us use it for you don't need us to be perfect. You just need us to care. And thanks for caring for us, no matter how imperfect we are. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Oh, Amen. Well, Chris, I know that I'm thinking about where my starfish can be. And so if you're online and you just want to put a quick comment about what your starfish you think that could be. And in person, you know, as, as we sing the songs together, maybe be thinking about the words and where you could serve. And how and what impact you can make. So friends, let's stand together and respond to what we just heard in song by singing together, Lord, whose str- love, whose strength, or whose humble strength.
Friends, you may be seated. So before we, we head out, we're going to have just a couple of announcements for what's going on in the life of the church. So the first thing is this evening we have Charge Conference. So this is an annual meeting that just helps us understand the new polity that's going into our, our local church. And you can be a part of that as well. We have a, a Zoom link if you want to watch on Zoom. That is in the comments below. Uh, you can also come here to the sanctuary. We'll be streaming uh, the Charge Conference here in the room. So if you want to be here and in person and uh, be a part of that way as well. We also have the, the paperwork and everything that's going to be put in place here. If you want to uh, find that, we have that in the back. And also, if you want to find that, we'll have it tonight here. Uh, so the next thing is we have our next steps class. So this is a simple conversation that Chris is going to lead us through for all of our people that want to get plugged in. So if you're one of those that have filled out our, our connection card or maybe you've been watching for a couple weeks and you don't know really know what's next, this is your perfect step. So our next steps class, November 15th after this service. So it'll be at 1215 down in room 117. Uh, just a really quick conversation about what membership looks like, how to get more plugged in, what small groups or Sunday school can look like for you. Uh, we would love for you to, to come, you know, maybe get plugged in and maybe invite a friend as well to our Next Steps class. Next, we have our Incarnation Advent book study. And this is kind of one that I'm leading and the charge on this. And I'm really excited about this. And friends, I know we just had a wonderful sermon, ser sermon about blessing in the mess and you know, this year has felt kind of like a mess. And so thinking about Christmas and, you know, the birth of Jesus and this time where we're really joyful and stuff, to be honest, this year the birth of Jesus feels very distant and feels like it's something 2,000 years ago and it's just this story that, that we recite and, yeah, it might be cool, but, but this incarnation book study, we're going to figure out what impact it can have on us today. You know, we have these, these titles for Jesus like Messiah and Lord but what does that mean and what impact can that have on us right now? And so that's what our book study is going to be about this year. And so if you're in a Sunday school class or if you don't have a Sunday school class and looking for a small group, I would love for you to sign up for this. We will start November 29th. And we have a lot of different times, you know, on Tuesday evening or Sunday. If you're not in a Sunday school class, we would love to get you plugged in to our Incarnation Advent book study. So now we're going to wrap up with Chris and our benediction. All right, friends, if you're in this space with us, I invite you to stand for a benediction. Uh, and our benediction today, I actually, uh, I, I went back and grabbed a hymnal really quick because I couldn't believe the lyrics of that last uh, hymn. And it was from the song, Lord Whose Love Through Humble Service. Uh, and the last verse said this, called, oh, actually, I'm going to let you, I'm going to read it and then use it as our benediction. Called by worship to your service. Uh, forth in your dear name we go to the child, the youth, and the aged, love in living deeds to show, hope and health, goodwill and comfort, counsel, aid, peace we give, that your servants, Lord, in freedom, may your mercy know and live. Like that is, that, that's, man, that was a lot better than a 30-minute sermon. Uh, so, uh, you know, just, if you just go page 581, just look it up, guys. Uh, and so I invite you to bow your heads for this benediction. So called by worship to your service, forth in your dear name we go to the child, the youth, the aged, love and living deeds to show, hope and health, goodwill and comfort, counsel, aid and peace we give, that your servants, Lord, in freedom, may your mercy know and live. Go in peace and go with God. Amen. We'll see you next week.